Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Creative Concepts. My name is Beck Lloyd and I'm a Birmingham Conservatory for Classical Theatre graduate and 2020 would have been my first season with the company. However disappointing, I am lucky because I am instead here with the director designer team of the festival's 2014 production of Antony and Cleopatra, which will be available online from July 2nd to July 23rd. So hello and welcome to Charlotte Dean, the production's designer. Hi there. Hi, a hi there. Wave. Wave. And, hi. Yeah, Gary Griffin, the production's director. Hi, hey. Gary. Hi, thank it's you. so great to have you guys with us today. Mm -hmm. I would love, we don't have that long, so I would love to just jump right in with these, uh, these discussion points. Just to get us going, can you two talk about the preliminary conversations you were having, um, the ones that, that got the ball rolling? What did you know you wanted to have in the production or experiment with in the staging? Uh, going into this, what, um, you know, what did you anticipate maybe having difficulty with those sorts of things well before the actors are in the room? What did, uh, what did that look like? This project came together sort of in a unique way. Um, <clears throat> Anthony uh, called me about <clears throat> doing, um, doing a Shakespeare play. I'd done musicals up to that point at Stratford. Mm -hmm. And I have some, um, some Shakespeare experience in Chicago. Um, I, I would really, I always had a dream to work on a Shakespeare play with the Stratford Company. And um, also I, I was hoping sometime to work in the Tom Patterson. And of course I knew what I'm sure I'll be more envious than ever. I love the Patterson for many reasons. I love it because some of my favorite shows I've seen at Stratford were there. And there's just something magical about the space. Um, and I think it was a bit of a surprise that ANC would be there because you think, again, you think it's, a, it's going to be a big show, big cast. The design will be a grand. And um, I was thrilled that we were doing it at the Patterson Lodge because we could, we could adjust your perspective on the piece potentially. And you, you wouldn't be expecting that. It, the, 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 the space doesn't allow for um, the kind of design you can do, for instance, in the festival. So that sort of shifting that expectation put everything on relationships and character and um, the um, a, a very immersive experience for the audience. Kind of everybody's coming in and out and around you. But I think the audience, I, what, I, what I noticed was it, at the beginning, they were, they were you know, taking it in. But I noticed as the play went on, there was a real leaning forward, not because it was especially quiet or, or um, they needed to do that. I felt there was a, a participation especially in the public scenes in the show, that they're that close to you and the, um, the energy we could get in that room was pretty extraordinary. I love that you, you do bring up the space because watching the film, I, abs I noticed I, I couldn't see the entrances and exits happening. The, the scene appeared before me. Um, and I can only imagine the kind of energy that movement would have created, especially as the military motivations pick up, escalating the language of the lovers. You know, it's all happening and it's all happening at once and pretty fast. So I imagine the space had to had to play a part in that. And even when I think about Charlotte, the, the costumes and how they're going to be seen is transformed in that space versus the festival. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, I think um, immersive immersive is a great word to use for for all of it um, and the the sort of instant scene change um, aside from the wonderful lighting of Michael Walton um, is it's a, it can be achieved by costumes I mean we basically created a, a very um, immersive space almost like the tomb itself with hieroglyphs on on columns and um, a dais and furniture pieces brought on, but sometimes it was just um, actors coming on in their battle wear and, and then you, you knew you were in, in a pretty bad battle or as in most of the cases, it was after the, after, in the aftermath of battle. Um, we would have, um, you know, very little time to kind of have the audience know that we are now in Egypt. You know, at the beginning of the play, we had, uh, more sense of color and and happiness, I and mean, we haven't quite gotten into the betrayal part of the love story. 
Um, and, uh, and I think it, it really, you know, it, it obviously sets the scene and it's, the festival is close, even though it's 2000 seats or approximately, um, you can see detail at the festival, but there's no getting around seeing, you can just see every single detail at the Patterson. Shakespeare offers us such fun with his histories and knowing that this show isn't done all the time, um, you had said earlier that the, the idea that this could be someone's first experience with the story. Um, how much, Charlotte and Gary, did you engage with, I don't want to say true history, let's call it academic history, in prep uh, for this production? One of the things I enjoyed most, and I so appreciated Charlotte's partnership on it, because my experience with the play had always been highly conceptualized productions that um, actually were, you know, the settings were based on, um, you know, conceptual ideas of, uh, you know, that did, that were not um, rooted in anything, period. Mm -hmm. So I'd never seen the production that looked like I might think the characters would have looked, that there was some attention to that. And I I, I was curious about it. I think just this period, Charlotte, help me out here. If, if it was, I think sometimes this period, unless you're doing comedy, tends to people get a little um, nervous about it or they don't, togas, you know, are associated, I, I, you're too young, some of you to know, with Animal House and toga parties in the 70s, they're a comedy costume. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, I remember I was in a meeting once and it wasn't about this play, but someone asked about that and she said, what do you want to see, togas? Went, well, if that's what they were, maybe we do. I, I, was, I was interested in it and it really was fascinating to see a group of actors, most of whom had never moved in this kind of costume before, mm -hmm. figuring out what power was. And I was great, I was really grateful that we could, and again, I think for most people, they, this is their first production, I would imagine a lot of the audience, and they were seeing it for the first time and did have some sense of, of what it might have been. Mm -hmm. Is that what you remember? <laughs> that's that's pretty much it. I mean, we're sort of circa 30 BC, but I, I there was a very conscious effort to um, bring in maybe the, a sensibility from the 1920s movies, which is you know for for the, or getting the best of each period and and pulling pulling that in. So the macho ness of of the soldiers, um, which you know is is pretty pretty great. Um, but then with the, the togas, we kept them long so that we could get that grandeur and that power. We, we were a little bit loose and, loose and free with the period, um, but, you know, essentially it was a, a fairly classical yeah. take on it. Yeah, well, well I, we always are a little loose, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think with, with the palette too, we were going with a more emotional palette than an actual Yes. yes, it would it would be this shade of papyrus that they were wearing, but uh, well, you know, and, and instead going for no. At this point, she's really angry, so we've got the burgundies and the yeah. the lush velvet. I think something that can be said universally about theater is that it continues um, it continues to be relevant because it holds that that mirror up for us. You know that um, that looks at society that reflects back the mirror, the mirror up to nature, of course. Um, and something that this video series offers us is, is not just when the production was happening, but also the ability to watch it right here and right now. So we have this unique opportunity to be able to compare um, two very tangible moments now and this 2014 production. And we have a way in to ask ourselves, what we're able to see now that we couldn't see before that would make this production perhaps look or feel or say something different. Um, so I would love to ask both, both Gary and Charlotte that question. One thing that I found a little maddening, but um, every day going to rehearsal, that the show is often classified as history, often classified as tragedy, last fight is romance. It is all of them. The, the categories of Shakespeare's plays um, reflect, um, I think, a lot about life and aging. You know, in comedy when you're young, you know, tragedies when you're middle-aged, and romance and forgiveness at the end. But I think 
in the middle of his life, this was, it was all clear to him. It was all, and he was trying to get two characters who could have the perspective on what's going on with human beings. I think that um, they, what, what, what uh, drove, Cleopatra knew too much, I always felt, that, and she can't unknow. Um, she see, she can, she, she has a perspective and a point of view that um, she, uh, she will not really be able to live as a mortal <laughs> because she has this, she has seen um, what human beings do. And I think Anthony did too. He's also, Anthony's wildly talented and he doesn't have any connection to it. He doesn't, you know, yeah, I, I'm the greatest soldier. Okay, I, I think it, it lost much personal meaning to him. Um, and this woman and this other culture and, and himself and his, his introspective journey that he takes mm -hmm. was something far more important to him. Charmian had, can't exert her power in public many ways, but she has Cleopatra's ear. She is her, she is her, um, she levels her, sen you know, there's a, there's a sensibility about her. I love the way Sophia did it because she, you, you could see her always there and she would have, I think she would have stepped in at any second. And, but she, um, and she, she knows that, she knows the woman that Cleopatra is. She knows the, the weakness, the, the fear, mm -hmm. and she speaks to it in a way no one else will. That anyone else would be killed, you know. Yeah. So those, those relationships to me were what would be fun to, because we are in a space where, we can, where intimacy can be heightened. Mm -hmm. And that was, those were the things I loved most about doing it there. Yeah, that's so interesting. Who do you become, not, not because of who you are, you know, inside out, but outside in, simply based on reputation or based on sh shape, form, color, whatever. Who do you become simply because what, um, what you're taking in? Um, are there design elements, Charlotte, that, uh, that sp speak to you in a similar way? And, and, not, and even not um, regrets, but a celebration of what you know six years later and the ability the to, to, you know, to look back at it in such a clear form, um, which isn't an opportunity a lot of, a lot of people get. I think, I think you always want to change every, everything. First everything and then nothing and then everything again. Um, I'm, we're pretty happy with what we did come up with. Um, but I think uh, much like what Gary's saying, it's just to get further, to get further in and to have more time. Yeah. Um, time, time is always, time is always the thing, right? You know, to, to be able to um, go into rehearsal and try something out and then change it mid rehearsal, as opposed to sometimes you're locked into the initial idea, um, just massaged a bit instead of being able to throw it right out and, um, and, and start from scratch um, in, in a particular thing that the um, I think what what we ended what our process ended up being was throwing things out a lot of times you know we had the first time we did the ship we had way loads more furniture and way more stuff more stuff so it the the sort of great thing about the show is that we did get it pared down to what I think were the essentials and I think going back at it again it would be hard to add too much more because you see how well it stands with the words because the words are amazing i mean the the you know the moment when um the dis the description of cleopatra coming in on the barge that you know barbus has the barge she sat in like a burnished throne burned on the water the poop was beaten gold purple the sails and so perfumed that the winds were lovesick with them the oars were silver, which to the tune of flutes kept stroke, and made the water which they beat to follow faster, as amorous of their strokes. For her own person, beggared all description, she did lie in her pavilion, cloth of gold, of tissue, or picturing that Venus where we see the fancy outwork nature. On each side her stood pretty dimpled boys like smiling cupids with diverse colored fans, 
whose wind did seem to glow the delicate cheeks which they did cool, and what they undid, did. You sort of look at that and go, well, how do you top that? Do we show that, you know? And, and I don't know if it would be great, you know, on one hand to, to show it, to have that all happening in the background. You know, this is, this is the million dollar per second budget I'm talking here, but to actually have a lot of the action that happens off stage, you, you kind of want to see it in a way, and then you think better of it, and you go, no, the words are the words are clearer on their own. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. All right, Gary and Charlotte, I have one last question for you because there's never enough time. Um, last year, Gary, in an interview uh, with Victory Gardens Theater, you said. The freedoms we want come from allowing ourselves to hear stories, to examine relationships we're not comfortable with at the beginning. How does experiencing a story make those love stories feel like ours? Um, I wanted to say that because I wanted it to be heard. Um, and many of us are spending more, much more time at home right now. Uh, so I just wondered if you two had any recommendations for the at-home audiences in terms of movies or shows or books, plays, entertainment that maybe asks for this type of examination, but mostly what are the two of you enjoying at home right now? A lot of Netflix. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but nothing replaces the theater I'm wearing too. It's, mm -hmm. it's irreplaceable. We're trying, we're trying. Yes. Um, but. Um, now, that said, what you're going to see is the best I think we can do as far as mm -hmm. it's, 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 cra it's crafted, it's captured in a way that uh, it, it has its own vocabulary of intimacy. Mm -hmm. It's not an experience anybody had in the theater. It, it, we, it capitalizes on what the medium has to, um, can capture and, and, and edit. But it, it's in the past, you know, theater's always present. This, it was recorded, it happened. We get to visit something that happened, but it can come very close. And if we engage in ways that maybe it'll feel a little more present than possible, but um, it's impossible to replace that. I, I, I've come to believe theater is usually about two things in our experience of it. We either go in and we see characters that we don't think of us and we look at them and we think of them as different and we laugh at them perhaps or pity them or whatever. But we end the evening never believing that we got a window to someone else's experience. There's none of us there. Then the other kind, which is every character we did one moment or another is us. And we see ourselves, it has been crafted in a way we, that we see ourselves in the piece. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the more rewarding version because it's it's it, it's eye-opening it's terrifying it's it's hilarious and it's um it's it connects us and i, I this i saw myself in, in all of the characters of this piece um especially the ones you wouldn't think possibly mm -hmm. because um fear and insecurity and 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 not it not being allowed of you you know that not being something you can be is a is a terrifying thing, and I I saw so much of. Um, well, I think if I think if I were there, I might do that. You know, there was a lot of, um, and it was shocking. But as as we lived in it more and more, I realized the that um, there are inevitabilities, and we may that we can. We can prolong them, but uh, ultimately, you know, there, there's going to be clash. <laughs> it, it's inevitable. And how do we, how do we live knowing that? I don't know that we can say that we can prevent war or um, the kind of um, unrest. But w w if we can recognize and know about it, maybe it can be about. Maybe the the conflict can be about. Um, education and communication and that destroying destruction. I'm so excited for our at-home audiences to engage or re-engage perhaps with this production. Um, it will be available online from July 2nd to July 23rd 
It is a history, a tragedy, a romance. Um, so it's, funny about, it's a lot of comedy in it too. So yeah, that's true. There you go. Yeah. Um, I think he was with, with really big royalty on this one. Yeah. Um, I love the idea of it being a dare and the the emotional palette. It has me thinking about the emotional palette of a dare. Um, so that's what I'm going to be thinking about for the rest of the day. Thank you so much for joining us, Gary and Charlotte. Um, Thank and thanks for being here, everyone. We'll talk soon. Hi, Miss you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.